uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano in his book, The Constitution in Exile, uh, noted that not a single federal law was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court from 1937 to 1995. So every once in a blue moon, you'll see the Supreme Court ruling in favor of the people and against the Washington establishment. But uh, maybe not even a full moon. Every once a century now is the, way, is the way it is. So essentially, we live in a regime of unlimited government. The only time Republicans ever really, apart from Ron Paul, ever talk about the Constitution is whenever they want to use it to block something the Democrats are trying to do. And the only time you ever hear a Democrat in Congress talking about the Constitution is when they want to try to use it to block something the Republicans are trying to do at the moment. But nobody believes in, in using it as a, as a limit on governmental power. I thought it would be useful to uh, try to tell the story of how this came about and why, why the Constitution had to be destroyed uh, based on some of my uh, uh, research in economic history. And, uh, and I'm going to just read you the answer. This is, what, this is why the Constitution had to be destroyed, in my opinion. So I guess I can sit down after I read this, uh, this paragraph here. This, uh, this was a, a statement by um, the late Murray Rothbard in one of his books uh, about uh, the very beginning of the American Republic about the very, very beginning of the American Republic, there always were the two factions in American politics. You had the nationalists who wanted a powerful central government uh, that would be very active and, and do all, all sorts of bad things. And then you had the Jeffersonian wing, uh, the decentralists who wanted limited decentralized government, limited taxation, uh, and, and so forth. And uh, you know, we've throughout the whole history of the country, we've had uh, a back and forth battle between the nationalists and the centralizers on the one hand, and the decentralizers and the more libertarian wing of, of American politics on the other. And here's how Rothbard described the nationalists. And of course, uh, Alexander Hamilton has always been looked at as the intellectual leader of the so-called nationalists of that time. What were they about? What did they want uh, at the beginning of the Republic when the American Revolution ended? Here's what they wanted according to uh, Rothbard. They wanted quote, I'm quoting, to, to reimpose in the new, new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain, against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. That's Murray Rothbard. And Alexander Hamilton actually uh, labeled this system the American system. How's that for Orwellian double talk? He wanted a clone of the British mercantilist system that the revolution had just been fought against and they wanted to call it the American system. And so you, if you break this down, what did they want? A, a centralized state where political power was uh, totally centered in, uh, in the federal government, heavy federal taxes and debt, discriminatory taxes, high tariff would be a discriminatory tax, and the original constitution prohibited discriminatory taxation altogether. They wanted corporate welfare run amok, essentially, and aggressive militarism. Does any of that sound familiar to anybody? Uh, could you, what, what, what country might you describe that is characterized today by these things uh, that, that you, might be, you might be familiar with? Of course, that's our system today. And so uh, I'm gonna argue that that was uh, why the Constitution had to be destroyed because the Constitution did not, uh, neither did the Articles of Confederation certainly create a highly centralized state with heavy federal taxes and debt, discriminatory taxes, corporate welfare run amok, and aggressive militarism. Uh, that, was not, that was not the system. So a, a, a very long, decades-long campaign or crusade had to be waged in a lot of different areas, in the courts, in politics, and elsewhere, to, uh, to destroy the Constitution so that this would be allowed, so that this would uh, uh, come, in, come into being. 
And uh, at the beginning of the American Republic, the, the, uh, the proponents of this, of course, were the Hamiltonians, Hamilton himself, uh, people such as uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, Marshall Joseph, Justice Joseph Story, a Supreme Court Justice, uh, Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, and Abraham Lincoln. Those were the nationalists up until the Civil War era. The opponents of all this were the Jeffersonians, Jefferson himself, Madison, Monroe, Andrew Jackson, President John Tyler, and, and people of that sort. And, and there was a, a very large uh, uh, battle that went on. Okay, And so uh, you have to understand a little bit of the history of this in, in that um, uh, Hamilton himself, when he, when he attended the Constitutional Convention, he did uh, propose a permanent president who would appoint all the governors. So this was, this was the first salvo in this decade-long political battle to, uh, to essentially uh, achieve a centralized monopolistic state. And the centralized monopolistic state was always tied to an economic agenda. It was a tied to that economic agenda that I just, just mentioned, the so-called American system. And so that's what Hamilton did. He laid out his plan of a permanent president uh, who would appoint all the governors who would have veto power over all state legislation. And that would have been identical to England. They just fought a revolution against that. And of course, they didn't win. They didn't win that. And there was a, a, a senator from Virginia at the time named John Taylor uh, who, uh, who smoked these people out. <clears throat> he wrote a great little book that has been recently been republished uh, and is based, is based on the notes taken at the Constitutional Convention by Robert Yates, who was the Chief Justice of New York at the time, who attended the uh, Constitutional Convention. You know, these men swore to secrecy at the Constitutional Convention, and that should have been a big giant rat. For those of you familiar with, uh, with uh, labor union antics, you might know that whenever there's a company that is bidding for contracts and is using non-union labor, labor unions often show up with a pickup truck with a gigantic inflated rat in the back of the pickup truck that's about 30 feet high. I don't know if you've ever seen this because they call the non-union workers rats. That should have been sitting outside of the convention hall in Philadelphia when they, when they, when they worked up the, the Constitution because they, they swore themselves to secrecy. And uh, you know, whenever you get a, a bunch of politicians in a room swearing themselves to secrecy, you know you should smell a big fat rat. And so, but, but the rat was exposed maybe 20 or 30 years after the actual event uh, in, in, in the form of James Madison's notes, which were eventually published, and also the notes by Robert Yates, who his wife published after his death in the 1820s. Uh, but here's what John Taylor, Senator John Taylor of, of Virginia, said about what was going on at the time. He said, what was being proposed was a national government nearly conforming to that of England, by Colonel Hamilton's project, the states were fairly and openly to be restored to the rank of provinces and to be made as, in, as dependent upon a supreme national government as they had been upon a supreme British government. And so the Jeffersonians were saying, wait a minute, we just fought a revolution against this system. Why would we want this? And of course, the reason why they wanted it is uh, the same reason why the King of England wanted it. He enriched himself and his friends with it at the expense of everybody else but it was a way to enrich the politically connected and the elite uh, you know, uh, uh, who supported the government. And of course, uh, when, when Hamilton and his uh, cronies did not get their way, Hamilton himself uh, denounced the Constitution as a frail and worthless fabric. Here's a, another thing that uh, John Taylor noted in his book. He said, uh, the convention attendees viewed the Constitution as a compact among the free and independent states and not the creation of a national government. It was proposed and seconded to erase the word national, so somebody did propose this, and substitute the words United States in the plural uh, in the fourth resolution, which passed in the affirmative. Thus, we see an opinion expressed at the Constitutional Convention that the phrase, quote, United States did not mean a consolidated American people or nation, and all the inferences in favor of a national government are overthrown. In all the founding documents, by the way, the, the words United States are always in the plural, meaning the free, independent, and sovereign states are united in creating a, a compact or a confederacy to achieve certain ends. It, there was no such idea of something called the United States government, the, the monolithic leviathan that exists in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, so Taylor uh, also, uh, as I said, smoked these people out in terms of their economic agenda. He said their intent was to create, and I'm quoting again, quote, monarchy and its handmaiden consolidation 
and its other handmaiden, Ambition, and a national government dressed up in popular guises, such as national splendor and national strength. So these were the original neocons. They talked about national splendor. Uh, I can imagine Bill Crystal writing an article for the Weekly uh, Standard or even a novel, National Splendor in the Grass, or something like that. I, uh, I could see, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the neocons got their start in the 90s with Crystal and David Brooks writing an article in the Wall Street Journal called National Greatness Conservatism. So it's, it's basically the same idea. Uh, I think in that article they proposed doing something like building a tunnel under the Atlantic Ocean to England. They said, now that the Cold War is over, uh, we need to get the government to do something really, really, really big, like build a tunnel under the ocean to, to Europe. Uh, although today they would probably change their minds about that. They would uh, fear that terrorists would come through the tunnel and nuke Americans. Uh, uh, now, Taylor also knew, he understood, and that wasn't just John Taylor, it was all the Jeffersonians. They understood that this push for a monopoly government where all power is centered in the nation's capital was always tied to the economic agenda. And the economic agenda is sort of an example of early day Krugmanisms. Uh, in other words, it, sound, it was convoluted, ass backwards economics of the sort that you would read in a typical Paul Krugman New York Times column. Here's, here's what John Taylor wrote in 1823 about what these people were up to. He's saying, he's mocking their economic arguments. He's saying, here's what they're saying. They're saying this, quote, I'm quoting John Taylor, the greater the government revenue, the richer are the people. So the more they tax you, the richer you are. So that frugality in the government is an evil thing. But in the people, it's a good thing. So get, the more of your money you give the government, and the more you let the government spend, that's a good thing. That's what saying. If it, that monopolies and exclusive privileges promote the general welfare, that a division of sovereignty will raise up a class of wicked, intriguing, self-interested politicians in the states, but that human nature will be cleansed of these propensities by a sovereignty consolidated in one government in the nation's capital. So the state politicians are wicked and evil, but the ones in the faraway capital where the citizens have no control over, they're saints. Uh, that, that's what he, and he was right about every part, every part of, uh, of, of this. And you have to understand that uh, the battle over the Constitution at the time was between the Jefferson, who, who saw the document as something that would bind government in chains. His famous phrase was, government needs to be bound by the chains of the Constitution. The Hamiltonians, totally the opposite. They saw this document as if it was properly interpreted by clever lawyers like themselves, as a potential rubber stamp on anything the government would ever do. As long as you could get enough government judges on the Supreme Court who are like-minded to go along with rubber stamping everything, then it could be a useful document. And uh, one, of the historian, one of the historians of Hamilton, a biographer of Hamilton, uh, said this of him. He said, it seems certain that Hamilton, had he had his way, would have affixed a certain certificate of constitutionality to every last tax. Hamilton took a large view of the power of Congress to tax because he took a large view of the power to spend. And uh, that, of course, is where we are today. You know, that statistic I mentioned from Judge Napolitano that the Supreme Court uh, did not uh, declare a single law of any kind unconstitutional from 1937 to 1995, that's the Hamiltonian system, rubber stamp, big government. And uh, Clinton Rossiter, uh, the, the biographer of Hamilton, said this of him. He said, having failed to persuade his colleagues at the Philadelphia Convention of the beauties of a truly national plan of government, and he's not being sarcastic, uh, Rossiter was a Hamiltonian, uh, and having thereafter recognized the futility of persuading the legislatures of three-fourths of the states to surrender even a jot of their privileges, he set out to remold the Constitution into an instrument of national supremacy. So in other words, as soon as they lost the political battle at the Constitutional Convention, they set out to, to reinterpret the Constitution so that the proper inter interpretation would be that it, is, it had created a highly centralized government with dictatorial powers, with heavy taxes, heavy debt, corporate welfare, aggressive militarism, and all these things that the nationalists always wanted. So through subterfuge, through lawyerly subterfuge, they set out to, to reframe the Constitution, and of course they, uh, they succeeded.